This is Leading with Power. Welcome to our April edition of Leading with Power today. I am excited to have with us uh, Vince Miller, and Vince is an author of books like this one, 20 Lessons That Building a Man's Finances Can Mean to You, and it's a conventional mentoring guide. Vince is an author and speaker. He speaks around the world. In fact, he's joining us live today from Haiti. Um, he, sp he speaks on topics including manhood, masculinity, fatherhood, mentorship, and leadership. He's authored 19 different books. Oh, that tires me out. Vince, I don't know how you do it, but 19 different books for men. And he's hosted on major video platforms like Right Now Media and Faith Life TV. I'm actually part of that Right Now Media, and I do find that to be a very helpful tool. He hosts a we weekly podcast, writes weekly articles, and provides daily thoughts from God's word, all just for men. One of his most widely read resources is the men's daily devotional read by men all over the world. You can find that at beresolute.org backslash MDD, men's daily devotional, MDD, beresolute.org, B-E-R-E-S-O-L-U-T-E.org. He's a 27-year ministry veteran and the founder of Resolute, a men's ministry platform that provides Bible studies aimed at building better men, men of Leading with Power, please welcome Vince Miller. And I'll be the only one that you can hear clap. So it's going to sound like a golf <laughs> clap there, Vince. Show us well, where I'm you're a... at, man. Start talking. Tell us about what's going yeah. on. What's the background behind you? Who are you? What well, are you? yeah, here I am. I'm actually an 80. I'll show you a picture. So uh, you can see the ocean back here, if you can still see it. And uh, there's a new port back here. I'm sitting up on a mountain right now. Uh, take a little break, and uh, cur uh, currently I am here uh, in partnership with Mission of Hope, which is one of the largest mission organizations in Haiti by far, and uh, they do a number of different things all across this country. This is one of their locations. I think it's a few hundred acres large, and here on this location, they empower Haitians uh, to have opportunities and locations for church services, health care. Uh, there is actually a vocational school here teaching, I think, about seven different trades, and it's all run by Haitians. Uh, in fact, um, the Carson Wentz uh, comp, uh, organization, I think it's called AO1, just built a facility down here that it had just opened. It is a full-size outdoor basketball court covered, lit the whole thing, and a full-size soccer field they're looking at putting two in. So Carson Wentz has been here and a number of other uh, big organizations partner with what happens here. For example, in uh, the Minnesota area, uh, um, what is the hunger organization there called? I'm struggling with it right now, but uh, I'll think of it here in a second. But uh, they basically feed here out of this facility that I'm on right now, 150,000 people every day out of this location. And uh, it is an amazing organization. I have a beautiful day. Uh, I don't know what it's like here in Wisconsin today, but- uh, Well, we're in the <laughs> 40s here. here. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's trying to be sunny, but hey, you're bringing <laughs> sunshine into our lives. So uh, you keep pouring it on, please. Well, I'm blessed and uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm also excited to be, uh, excited to be with you guys as well. Uh, thank you for inviting me again, fellas. I got to tell you, uh, Brent, thank you so much, John as well. Love you guys. Love what you're doing with Leading with Power. Love that there's guys on this call today. And uh, of course, today we're going to be talking about finances. I'm assuming I can carry that away now. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Oh, yeah, well, man. let me uh, let me just encourage you guys today by saying this, that there, there's a lot of topics I speak about that I feel a great level of confidence about. And uh, uh, one of those areas is actually mentorship. I, I feel very confident in that, I feel very confident teaching God's word. But the place where I felt the least amount of confidence is actually when I wrote that book you just shared with the guys there, 20 Lessons That Build a Man's Finances. That's designed to be a mentoring guide. And to be quite honest, when I was kind of going through the book, I think I felt a little bit inadequate about how even I understand finances. I would assume some of you guys out there 
uh, like Brent, worked in the finance industry in some way or shape or form. But when it comes to finances, I feel a little bit inadequate because I'm not sure I'm the best guy to talk about. It. Now, I do know that I'm probably good at talking about biblical principles related to finance. So that's what I'm going to talk about today and even share some of my shortcomings uh, in relationship to this. In fact, my first book, uh, well over 15 years ago, was actually a book entitled The Generous Life. And essentially what I did was I shared my story in relationship to the pain that I experienced in life with my finances because I came to discover that this was probably perhaps not just the biggest challenge for me, but the biggest challenge for men, uh, the biggest challenges for, one of the big challenges for churches, one of the big challenges in marriage. <laughs> I think men are thinking about their finances actually all the time. And even as I was preparing this talk, guys, I started to think a lot about what are some of the principles I've learned over, uh, you know, the last few decades of my life and being a follower of Jesus Christ related to the area of finances. So today, uh, I'm actually doing a very original message uh, that has really been close to my heart. I have never shared these principles this way with anyone ever, so I'm really privileged to be able to do that here today with you guys at Leading with Power. So I'm going to share with you a few principles, actually seven of them, that I have learned about finances the hard way in my life. And so if you guys would just take a second and maybe share with me in the chat dialogue just one principle, one principle, a biblical one at that, that you have learned about a man guiding your finances in life. I'd love to hear that right now. I just kind of want to see it here because I'm going to share with you seven today that have transformed my life. And I'm going to try to find a verse that relates to these or a story from the Bible and also part of the tension related to that. So let me guide you through these seven principles. Now, the first one is this. I call it the, the principle of the provider. And uh, often when I'm thinking about the principle of the provider, I'm thinking about who is the provider. Because I think we in life as men have a little bit of this tension between us being a provider and then God as the ultimate provider. Because I, th I think most men would assume or even say that we as men or as leaders in our family have a responsibility to provide. But I also believe that there's a limit to that provision. There's a limit that we hit eventually that helps us to really understand that there is an ultimate provider and that he's providing us the resources. So the story that I always go back to, of course, is the biblical story of Abraham and Isaac. And the reason why I go back to the story is because this is one of the first times in the Bible that we hear a man of God call God the provider. In fact, the terminology is Jehovah Jireh, or the Lord, the provider. And in the story, essentially, here's how it goes. Uh, Abraham, uh, a man of faith, wants to have a child, and uh, he wants to have the child of promise, finds out that his wife is pregnant. God gives him that child, gives birth to that child. The child grows, and when that child becomes essentially a young man, in their understanding of young men, God calls Abraham to do something ridiculous. And, and you need to know this. Abraham, up until the moment that God called him, uh, was really a pagan man that grew up in a pagan country. If you really know his history well, you'll understand that he grew up under pagan parents in a pagan land with a pagan history, but then God spoke to him one day and he was obedient. That's what makes Abraham really that the, I, I think the ultimate example of faith. But I believe that there was a reason that he was the ultimate example of faith, because after God made this promise that he was going to give him a child, a child of promise, God then challenges Abraham to do something that just absolutely seems ludicrous in my mind as a father, maybe in your uh, mind too, as a father. He asked Abraham to take his son up to a mountain and literally sacrifice him, offer a human sacrifice to God. Now, we know in the story, if you read the story, that Abraham does take his son Isaac up to Mount Moriah, which eventually eventually becomes Jerusalem, uh, and eventually is a place where Jesus Christ himself was sacrificed by the hand of God. But, but, but Abraham is very obedient to the call, takes his son up to the mountain, is about to swing a knife at his son, and God stops him. 
And God stops him and provides for him a ram caught in the thickets. And God tells Abraham to not offer a human sacrifice, but to offer a ram sacrifice to him. And essentially what Abraham does is he names that place and his God, the God that provides. And while we get really entranced by Abraham's faith, in fact, Abraham is called the father of faith for this instance, in this moment of faith, we have to look at the object of faith too. And it's the very fact that Abraham actually believed the entire way up the mountain that the Lord was going to provide. The Lord was going to provide in some way, even as we read the New Testament, the Lord was going to provide some way, but the way the Lord provided was by providing an animal sacrifice. Therefore, Abraham doesn't offer the first human sacrifice. The person to offer the first human sacrifice in all of Christianity was actually God who offered his son on that same GPS location thousands of years later. So why I tell you the story and why I think we really need to understand this dividing moment is because when I think when it comes to finances, we deal with this tension. It's a tension of understanding, do we, we provide or does God actually provide? And there is an element of provision where Abraham actually did provide. He did provide by doing the good work of going up the mountain. But then there's this moment of trust where we have to believe with our finances and with all the resources that we have that God is going to intervene and provide. And I think men struggle with this sometimes because we're too much in the process of provision. This has perhaps been, I would say, of the seven lessons I'm going to share with you today, this has been the hardest because I feel that I, as a man, so many times feel that I should be the provider, that I should possess, that it's my responsibility to do that. And sometimes my responsibility to provide gets in the way of God actually providing in a miraculous way yeah. in our life. Yeah. So yeah. there's a big tension in. there. Yeah, if I could jump in right there, uh, Vince, uh, this is really good. Um, I just appreciate you sharing this so much. Um, your grandfather really impacted you and brought you to the place where you're full-time as a speaker and author, and you travel around the world teaching men, and mentoring men. So you live in this place where you're you're operating by faith. So you're obviously bringing support in to help you with what you're doing. You're trying to build a charity. You're trying to write books and get those published and sent out and distributed around the world. So how does that work for you where uh, things are tight and, uh, and you're asking God, you know, God, you called me to this and where's, where's the provision? So help, help us just get a little reality check on that. Help us to understand how it works for you as somebody who uh, definitely has to live in that way for, for in, in a sense, to make a living. Help us. Yeah, exactly. So as it relates to the nonprofit that I lead, uh, I think you ask a very honest and a very, you're asking me to draw on that transparency and I appreciate that. So there's a couple of things that I recognize. Uh, first off, it's that, there's going to be times that actually the work that I do generate the rev generates revenue for the organization so that we can do what we do. But there's also the tension of not allowing revenue to become a God to me. On the other hand, there have been moments where I've had nothing, literally nothing in the account, wondering how I'm going to make it the next day. And then God miraculously provides. It's the tension, I think, Brent, between working hard and giving an effort, but not allowing that effort or that thing or that resource to become God so much that I clench my hands. I called it closed handedness. But what God may want to do, and I've got to live in a very open handed way in my relationship with God, understanding that any moment he may take something from me to remind me he's the provider or give something to me to remind gotcha. me he's the provider. So that's how I wrestle with yeah. every day. I wish I, I wish I could tell you I have this one solved, but I actually don't think God wants us to solve it because I think he wants us a little bit on edge, not to irritate yeah. us, but to get us to trust in faith with him. And that's the point of the, the story with Abraham, right? Is that really it's about igniting faith and the object being God. And as long as we're igniting faith and the object is God and not money or things or possession or identity, right? It, we're we're probably living between those two tensions really well. 
All right, let me take you to principle number two. And, and, and the principles are gonna get a little simpler along the way, but principle number two is the principle of trust in anxiety, the principle of trust in anxiety. And this, this, was, this is a big one for me too, because I'm an anxiety guy. I'm just gonna confess that to you, Brenton, guys. But uh, uh, there's, there's, there's a section of scripture that's been very, very meaningful for me in this way. It's actually from Matthew chapter six. And it goes something like this. Uh, Jesus says something like, what should we eat or, or what should we drink or what should we wear? And we have all these concerns, right, <laughs> about things of this life. And then he says something to the nature of Gentiles seek after these things as, as to be a little bit condescending about eating and drinking and wearing, right? I mean, these are basic necessity too. But he says to the guys, he says basically, but, 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 and whenever Jesus says that, I pay attention. He says, but seek first the kingdom of God in his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. And then he says, therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow will be anxious for itself because it has its own anxiety, right? So uh, the tension here in this one for me, is, especially when it comes to finances, is the tension between fearing God and fearing things of this life or fearing man. And I think this especially comes up for men when our finances are threatened, okay? So this is one level of that. We have anxiety. And let's just be honest with ourselves. We do have anxiety about finances. We have anxiety when we have little, and we have actually anxiety when we have a lot. <laughs> I, I think we actually have anxiety on both sides of the fence, but do we really truly have anxiety about God? And when I think about anxiety, I actually think about fear. And I think there's two types of fear. There's fear of things in this life. And then there's fear of God. And fear of things in this life drives away, unfortunately, fear of a holy God. And fear actually is a good thing because fear produces change. But then there's this holy concept of fear, which breathes reverence. And that's why we experience anxiety. So I think when it comes to finances, sometimes I experience anxiety because I am fearing things of this life, whether it's I have too little or too much, right? But I need to really turn that fear toward a holy reverent fear of God back to him as the provider. And when I'm living in that moment, all anxiety drops to the wayside. Yeah, man, I so, I so, I so hear you. One of the things I wanted to ask you about is on your hat, it says all in. <laughs> and yes, so we have anxiety when we think deep down in our soul we think we're our provider not god is our provider and if we're not getting it done we're anxious because you know or even turning the trust over to god like are you really going to come through here god i can probably do this better than you and he's god and we're not right so uh i hear you completely so yeah they're, they're, all these principles are a little bit related and you're right this all in idea right here is about living all in for him who lived all in for me, but we, we spent a lifetime really understanding what that means. But guys, I, I just want to reiterate this principle. It's a principle of trust in anxiety. We have to learn to trust when we're anxious and fear God more. Principle three is this, the principle of identity. And, and fellas, I can't say how important this is. I want to accentuate this with a, a section of scripture. It's actually a section of scripture from Paul himself, it's from uh, Ephesians 2, if I remember correctly, he says something to this nature. He says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has actually prepared us in advance to do, in advance to do. And I think sometimes as men, uh, we, we fail to really understand that God actually is our creator. I mean, if you're a man out there today, you were created by God from beginning to end. We sometimes self-depreciate, self-dismiss. <laughs> uh, we, we actually try to disassociate ourselves from God, but God never disassociates from us in that he is the creator and the designer and wants us to be in a right relationship with him and then use those gifts in a way to bring him glory. But, but here, here, I think, is the big tension, right? The tension is this. It's the tension, right, uh, of the, the tension between what I have and I really believe, uh, uh, I mean, rather the tension between who we are and who God wants us to be. Because when it comes to our identity, sometimes our identity is wrapped up too much in what we do. 
this is more true for men than any other gender out there. And I really believe there's only two, but it's true for men, I think way more than women because the predominant thing that we talk about most of the time when it comes to our identity are the things that we do and we can get wrapped up in that. And yes, we are God's handiwork, but sometimes we only see our own handiwork, right? Rather than truly God's handiwork. And what I mean by this is this, uh, and I came to learn this uh, a number of years ago. One of the number one reasons that a man's life falls apart and that he actually goes to a therapist is because he's actually lost his job. And because he's lost his job, he's actually lost his identity. And because he's lost his identity, he becomes very, uh, he becomes a very difficult man to live with. And therefore his wife implores him to go to a counselor. And here's why. Here's why he's got to go to a counselor is because all of who he was when he lost this job was wrapped up in what he did rather than who he was in Christ. And now his whole world is shattered. His identity is shattered because he doesn't have something to do, right? And therefore, he has to like rediscover who he is because his identity really wasn't found in God himself. It was found in what he does. And this is a major challenge for us. I've had to learn this in my own life. It is not what I do that identifies who I am. It's who I am in God. And even more, it's who God says that I am by his own mouth and the handiwork that he has designed me with. And I think this is the great challenge for men. It is actually finding the convergence between what we do and who God is and living like literally in the beauty of that design and, and then living out that identity in Jesus's name. So that's principle three. Fantastic. Yeah, I, um, I, I'm right with you on that. The identity I've needed to help change in my heart has been helped by reading through affirmations of who I am in Christ. And I've done it every day. I wrote down lists that became longer lists that I continued to read for years. And now I go back to them every now and then uh, during the month, uh, just to remember, but affirmations, reading the word, understanding who God says you are. These are absolute keys in order to gain confidence and contentment in our lives with what we have, what we do and who we are. Exactly. That leads me perfectly into principle four. And I call it the principle of enough, of enough. Uh, Ecclesiastes 519, which is one of my favorite verses, says something of this nature. It says, everyone also to whom God has given like wealth and possessions and power, he, he wants us to enjoy them and to accept, to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. I, I love that verse because it just says that God has created us to enjoy to really enjoy. But I think men so often get to a place where they enjoy, but then want more and then want more and then want more. There's all kinds of parables in the New Testament to talk about this because the Bible talks a ton about money. In fact, Jesus talked a lot about money. In fact, more about money than he did about love, believe it or not. So uh, there is something about enjoying and kind of having enough, right? I call this the tension uh, really between what we have, right? and this lack mindset. And uh, fellas, I think this lack mindset is of the enemy, right? Uh, essentially, you could call this almost contentment. It's a principle of enough or the principle of contentment, right? Uh, I actually did this a number of years ago to make this real pragmatic. And I've, I've stayed with this, Brent and fellas. I, I just want you to know I've stayed with this. A number of years ago, I chose a number. I chose a number that I wanted for myself, a number that would be my income that I needed, a number that would help me to take care of my family, et cetera, et cetera. And I had that number. And I got to tell you, ever since I've chose that number, that has been burned on my heart and my soul. And to be quite honest, God has shown me that number every single year since I chose it. And there's been years that I've kind of wanted more, but God had gave me that number again. And you know what I'm talking about? It's a number for income. It's a number for care. It's a number for provision. And it's just taken the weight of driving for more and more and more off the table. Now, now get this, while my income has always stayed the same, my impact worldwide has continued to grow. And I love that. Like we can have endless impact without necessarily needing more money. And of course, today I'm talking about money and finances, but I kind of have a number. Just like people would set a budget, I set an income number and that's it. And I'm really bad at budgets. So we're not gonna talk about budgets today. So yeah, that's, that's really all. <laughs> Absolutely terrific. John, 
uh, has a comment for us. He says, uh, what we do identifying us and not who we are is very American as a concept. He said in other parts of the world, it's quite different. Probably in Haiti, it's, it's different where you are right now, Vince. He said that um, COVID-19, the pandemic has really decimated this and made us all kind of think about what really matters and who we are. Thanks, John, for sharing that comment. Vince, in your book, um, Rules for Finance, mm -hmm. Building uh, building Man's <laughs> Finances, and you, you mentioned Hebrews 13.5, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, that, that is a great principle. You really think about, you know, actually, I want to, just for a second, since you're talking about Hebrews, let's go back to Paul, who, who we think wrote the book of Hebrews. Uh, he had moments he wasn't content, right? But let's just take this moment that you're talking about. Uh, he's, he's written, uh, he, he always had this desire to go to Rome and this vision for Rome, but he was prevented from going. Many of us probably know that. What's fascinating about that, that moment that he was actually prevented from going, he felt like, man, I really wanted to get there. I'm sure he felt that way. What he ended up doing was actually writing the book of Romans, if you think about it, right? Because he couldn't go to him, he wrote the book of Romans. But think about this just for a second. Because he wrote the book of Romans, he influenced more people in all time, even better than going to Rome. I mean, think about that for a second. I mean, I read the book of Romans this morning, right? And it's crazy. We hold the Bible in our hands today because of Paul. I mean, this is crazy stuff. Sometimes in our lack, uh, if we can learn to be content, God might be doing something in our contentment to increase those resources and that influence in a way that we don't see but we have to learn to do this with money. You know, the principle is this, the principle of enough. Let me jump to principle five. Principle five is the principle of stewardship. And uh, Brent, I would assume because you work with philanthropy, you talk about this all the time. I'm gonna get to generosity too, but right now principle of stewardship. So my mind goes back to Luke. I think it's chapter 12 where we start to hear about the, the, the story of the faithful manager, right? So there's these managers and there's, ones that are not faithful and they're one, there's one that is. They, of course, the, 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 the master sets his manager over his entire house, blesses him, gives him a great portion of things from others, by the way. And uh, I, I think this principle from this text really helps us to see the tension between stewardship and ownership. If you go back and read the story very, very carefully, the master of the house, of course, represents God, and the managers are supposed to represent us. <laughs> and we have different ways we can manage, right? But the manager understands this, that he's not an owner of that, so he doesn't hide stuff. He doesn't possess stuff. He's just a steward of it. And fellas, we have got to learn the lesson that everything that we enjoy in this life does not belong to us. We are simply stewards. I think this lesson is really harder for us because if you read a lot of other parables or stories in the New Testament from Jesus, there is literally hell to pay for people who think they possess things. <laughs> you possess nothing. The principle of stewardship is throughout the New Testament, actually throughout the Bible. This is a very important lesson because this is actually where our faith begins. We begin our journey with Jesus Christ by surrendering to him all of who we are and he becomes the Lord of our life, the ruler of our life. Therefore, after that moment, after that moment, we are simply stewards, not just of things in this life that we think we possess, but actually our life because Christ paid, we say this all the time, Christ paid for our life, right? Paid for it, so who owns it? Well, Jesus Christ owns your life. That's why I live this way right here, all in. And uh, I think the call to stewardship is a big one that's harder for men to learn. But, but fellas, we've got to learn to be stewards of what we're given, the very breath that we're given, the life, the attitude, our voice, our finances as well. So that's principle number five. Uh, I know on the call right now, uh, Josh is, is on the call. And uh, Josh is my friend from Madison. And I've just seen God work in his life in an amazing way with provision, abundant provision as he's got that right as as he has seen that god owns it all and we're stewards of his resources i wish right well now, and Josh, you could chime in on that and tell your yeah, story yeah I, I, let me let me just ask you a question you work in philanthropy you help people give right like do you see 
people struggle, even, even in philanthropy, people really struggle with stewardship and the understanding of stewardship. Absolutely. Yeah. I think one of the best ways to give in church is to hand your wallet to the person next to you. And then you can give like he always wanted to give from somebody else's wallet. But I, I think that the, um, the gravity of understanding, like the comments that are said right here, I'll just kind of turn it right back into what's going on here. Uh, <clears throat> George meets us from Colorado Springs. Welcome, George. Len says that money's uh, only good for the good it can do. Uh, Jim Spears says God owns everything. And I think as we, as we understand that our very lives, the breath in our lungs, you know, what we do every day is a gift. Every day is a gift. What we have is, is a gift. And King David said it well at the end uh, when he was dedicating the temple. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. Everything in heaven and earth is yours. You are exalted and you're king overall. When we understand that, and like you said, Vince, and we hold it with an open hand before him and allow him to move it in and out and have us build relationship with him, which lasts forever, the things of this world uh, really begin to um, dim or diminish as we really want the kingdom wealth. We want the, the kingdom principles, the kingdom of God to come as Jesus prayed, your kingdom come, your will be done. Right back to you, Vince. Yeah, so, okay, let's jump to principle number six. Principle number six is this, it's the principle of giving. So jumping out of stewardship, if we have a stewardship mindset, then therefore we should give. Um, Deuteronomy 16, 17 says this, every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord that he has given you. So you, under, you, you hear that verse carefully. Here's what it's saying. Every man should give as he is able, according to the blessing that God has given you, so you should give. I mean, you really hear, hear that. The principle of stewardship's coming out of it, but it's also a principle of giving. And uh, I came to learn years ago that just actually learning how to give like literally give, and you can give anything. Don't get me wrong. You can give of your time. You can give of your finances. You can give of your energy. Uh, you can give of your mental capacity. Um, you, you can give in a lot of different ways. You know, one of the big ways I give is I speak a lot to men across the world. It's one of the ways I give God's word uh, to the world. And, and it's a blessing to me too when I give. But uh, I, th I think sometimes we, we fail to really see the tension between getting and giving. And in our culture, I believe we're sold this idea all the time. And I'm talking about American culture. Get, 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 get. And we are indoctrinated with that message. I mean, indoctrinated on everything that we see, everything that we hear, everything that we read. And this, this, this posture of giving is really awkward for us because we don't do it enough. But if we, we see it in action and we start to engage in it, we start to feel the blessing in it, but we don't do it for the blessing, right? It's not the reason that we do it. We do it from a genuine heart. And I think that's the tension is sometimes we start by giving in the, in the discipline of giving, right? We learn to give by actually doing it, even if it's hard. And then our heart begins to change. Our heart really begins to change. And then we enjoy the blessing of the giving, not to get, but actually to give because we see the beauty of what happens there, the mystery of it. I actually think this is why God commanded us to give to the church. He commanded us to give to the church because he knew that we'd have to learn how to give and tangibly understand the experience of it, receive the blessing of it, but then the heart has to change in the process. And so this has been a big lesson for me to too, uh, even, even in those hard moments when I know that I I feel like my money may be going to something that I question. I still learn to give because it's more about me being obedient and my heart for him than it is about what happens sometimes with that gift on the other side of it. Because it, it may not always go to exactly what I hope it will go to or be used in a fashion uh, that would be honoring to God. Uh, this is actually why I give money to beggars that I see or people panhandling. I actually give not just to uh, benefit them. I, I give actually sometimes just to benefit me and to make sure my heart is always in the right place. Now, some people question that, but I do that out of the discipline of my heart to ensure that always my heart is in the right place. So I think- One of the, one of the comments from Joel here is, uh, as I read, 
the text, it says, we're not giving, we are not keeping. You said in your book uh, <laughs> by Billy Graham, if a person gets his attitude towards money straight, it'll help straighten out almost every area of his life. Speak a little bit towards giving and the impact you see it does for a country like Haiti, uh, that you're there in the compound, you're seeing what good it does for the people. Explain a little bit about, about that impact, uh, both uh, you know where you're at back home and where you're at now here in Haiti. Yeah, well, just I'll tell you today here at Mission of Hope, I've I've, I've seen some things today. So I I, I saw a I, I saw a facility a facility built to provide health care, and I saw people in line. Uh, today I saw a vocational training environment where people are being taught uh, how to plumb, how to weld, how to work on cars, how to do IT work. Okay, uh, today I saw uh, village ambassadors overseeing a couple of different villages where uh, they were uh, they are kind of the gatekeeper for uh, massive amounts of food coming in bringing churches together communication etc today i saw a basketball court and a soccer field where kids come to play and learn how to play sports well with with coaches uh, and here's the best part of this whole thing all the people leading this movement were indigenous people. And so what I see is giving coming from all kinds of places internationally, a lot of it coming from the United States of America, funding small projects to mobilize indigenous people to actually do work where the gospel is being shared on a regular basis. And I'm not just talking about occasionally being shared. I'm saying they're sitting in a classroom where now this building has been funded where a, a teacher is literally sharing the message of Jesus Christ with their students as they're learning a vocation, or a doctor or a nurse is serving someone who's being healed and sharing the gospel message, or an ambassador in a village that has been built essentially with all American money so that people can have houses and a community and a church that is sharing the gospel message. So I, I think sometimes when it comes to giving, we don't see that impact, that's what I enjoy about being in places like this is I can actually see with, with an organization I think is doing it well, actually see a uh, indigenous people leading because of American dollars that were funded that are not dirtying the process and not infecting the process with the need to give more and more and more. They're actually becoming self-sustaining units to better a country, change a culture for Jesus Christ. Because I know this, some of those trades people are gonna graduate this program they're going to know Jesus Christ and they're going to affect the culture of Haiti and change the culture. That's how we change cultures, my friends, <laughs> is we, we allow people that we have birthed to essentially become an influence for the kingdom in areas of politics or commerce or business or healthcare or trades, whatever it might be. And, and that's where you really, that's where I look to put my dollars to use so that they can best benefit the kingdom. All right, let me jump into my last principle and th this is it, but I actually do think of all the other six that I've really struggled with in my life, uh, this is the big one. And I, I, I really truly believe that this is the hardest one to live by, fellas. It's called the principle of generosity, true generosity. Okay, so uh, of course I, I think of the, the parable of the seed and the sower, right? So. Uh, we think about the harvest of righteousness, you know, talked about there. Uh, Paul also talks about it in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9. And it's this parable of just expanding influence, right? I do think that there's points in our life, fellas, where we struggle through finances and we struggle to really get a handle on the concept, kind of a lot of these principles. But if if you can imagine it like a flywheel or a great pendulum swing, like a, a gymnastic swing, uh, for those of you who are athletes, if you understand the gymnastics hip and the swing, I believe finances kind of work like that. Like you have to create some initial momentum, right? Where you're forcing your finances to kind of get going and you get the kip and you try to get the kip a little harder. And eventually the swing brings you all the way around uh, the pole, the gymnastics pole. And then eventually momentum is created, all right? And once this momentum is created, this is probably true for you, Brent, with a lot of the people you work in philanthropy, they got a lot of momentum. So when that momentum is really created, you can really be generous, like crazy generous. And I'm not talking about just in your finances, although that's one area. 
but you got to get the momentum going to where you can truly be generous. And I believe only a few people in life really experience this, but each and every one of you guys listening today have a gift. You have a gift. And there's a place where you're going to do a lot of hard work for that gift, but eventually that gift is going to get some momentum and it's going to start to go. This has been true for me when it comes to speaking publicly or writing. I have momentum now. And because I have momentum now, I can be generous with my gifts. I can be generous with my resources. I can share them with the world, which is what I'm doing here actually on this trip. And as, as I'm here in, in Haiti, and as you begin to experience this momentum, you begin to get the feel of true generosity and how, listen very carefully to this, how there's this tension between like a part of our life that can be generous and then all of our life that can be generous, like all of it. Uh, there's a few people in history that I, I believe that have experienced this. And in the world of finances, of course, I think like maybe the Green family who, you know, are very, very generous family. Uh, I, I might even start to refer to someone who lives in Minnesota, Mike Lindell with my pillow. I think he's experiencing a level of uh, a, a level of, of influence around making pillows. And I'm not just talking about his money, just a level of influence around his industry perfection that has created influence for him in other ways, whether it be politically, uh, whether it be with his faith in writing books, whether it be with like 40 lines of sheets and pillows and slippers and all that kind of stuff. He's just now is experiencing levels of, of generosity where he can do speaking. And now he's building a platform, I think, for uh, a freedom of speech. Like, it, I just think we hit a place in our life where we begin to see all of our life as something that God possesses. And we begin to see it through the eyes of God. Uh, just, just consider uh, the words from 2 Corinthians. It's actually from chapter 9. It, it says something of this nature. It says, he who supplies... He who supplies seed, uh, seed to like the sower and the bread will supply and multiply all your seed for a harvest of righteousness. I really want you to think carefully about that. So he, that's God, who supplied seed for the, the, the sower and for bread for food, he will richly supply you for a harvest of righteousness. Fellas, I believe there's some of you that get this principle. You understand that God has given you something so not just steward for yourself, but to steward for the kingdom. And when you start stewarding it for the kingdom, it starts doing crazy stuff, like crazy kind of stuff. And that's really where I want to end today, Brent, is I really want to end with that one, because I think that's the place that's the hardest for us to get to. It's a place where we see everything. A uh, perfect example of this is, um, uh, oh, my goodness. What's her name? Uh, uh the nun from Calcutta. What's her name, Brent? Oh, sister. Um. <laughs> yeah. Why can't I think of her? <laughs> the nun from Calcutta. Yes, the generous one who gives to every. <laughs> yeah. What? Someone write her name in the chat. There, Mother Teresa. Thank you. Mother Teresa. Uh, yes. Thank Mother you. Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa. Thank you, Alfred. Thank you, John Kelly. She's from. She's from Calcutta, but I can't remember her name. Anyway, I, I think Mother, Mother Teresa understood the power of generosity. Her influence was at such a place that she gave all the time. And really what she gave of was her influence, her pure influence. I mean, she was known for being so kind. that I mean, she really didn't have money. I mean, think about it. But she is like known for being one of the most generous people in the world. Why was she known for being generous? Because she was kind and loving and patient. When she took resources. a vow of poverty, so she was impoverished, and she's known as generous. Boom! There, you said it better than I did, Brent. You should well, be talking. No, today. I mean, I'm just saying. Yeah. In the book, uh, you wrote down uh, the verse that you just shared, Second Corinthians nine six to eleven. He who supplies seed for the sower and bread for the for food will supply yeah. and multiply your seed for sowing and increase your harvest of your righteousness. And then it ends with. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us, through through produce us thanksgiving, will produce yeah. thanksgiving to God. Yeah. And, and when we think about Mother Teresa, we have that, that gratitude well up in us. I have one quick story uh, just to interject as I hand it, hand it back to you. But uh, when I was, I met Bill Bright a couple decades ago during the Jesus Video Project. Yeah. And he had a story to share with us. We were in his conference room. There were 20 people there. Mr. Douglas was in there and Bill Bright was in there. And he said, he told the story of the Hunt brothers from Texas 
they gave at the height of cornering the silver market, they were billionaires and they gave a million dollars, which 20 years ago was worth more than it is today mm-hmm. to fund the, the Jesus video project was probably like 30 years ago. Yeah. Uh, but he told the story to us 20 years ago. Anyway, whenever they funded the Jesus video project, um, he wrote the check for a million and then the silver market crashed. So he wrote the check out of the abundance and then the silver market crashed and they were no longer billionaires. And what Bill Bright said to us was that the Hunt brothers only regret was that they didn't give more. Yeah. When they, yeah. Had, they didn't give more out of the generosity of her kids. They gave a lot and there's many people that came to Jesus through the Jesus video project. Uh, but but well, it's one of the most story? it's one of the most influential projects of all time. Like I what happened with that project is still today the most influential project of all time. So and I spot that, on, great story. You know, like like the, uh, the, uh, the the chosen thing with, you know, 11, 11 million through crowdfunding, one of the most successful crowd, crowdfunded projects with, uh, I guess you could say, <laughs> a new uh, dramatic television series about the life of Christ and his disciples uh, also these days is now gaining traction and is highly recommended to watch. Rob Zum asked this question to you, please, Vince. He said, when serving in the mission fields overseas, how do you overcome the language and cultural barriers to effectively communicate with indigenous people? Great question. Uh, I have a translator with me. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, here, honestly, the best part is that um, really, I, I, I really... While, while there, there's ways to help, there's ways that you don't want to help, right? Um, and there's, there's, there's points at which helping actually might really hurt. Uh, I actually believe to some degree from the stories I've been hearing today that the pandemic has essentially cleaned out a, a lot of American mission industry here and then forced the indigenous people to, to rely more upon themselves, which I think actually is a very, very good thing. Um, it, it might actually resurrect a new day and a new movement for the people of this culture. And uh, it's, it's super exciting to me. Um, so uh, how, how I overcome some of those barriers, they're, they're difficult, especially, you know, right now I'm in Haiti, which I would say the formal language is French, but the, the common language is Creole. I don't speak either one of those languages. I do provide my daily Devo in the French language, but I, I'm just not sure it's that helpful. I know that right now uh, Vince's uh, picture just froze a little bit. So I'm going to ask a, a question from Bill Ray. Bill Ray says, asks this question. He asks, is your book on finances conducive for an 8 to 12 uh, Bible study for men? And the answer is yes, that this is actually built to uh, build community. And Bill, uh, when I asked Vince, uh, during our preparation for today's call, I said, what's the number one thing you want men to do? And he said to me, have men talk with other men. If we can have men talk with other men, that's really achieved uh, his goal. And this book is one that can do it. At the end of today's uh, lesson. Um, oh, John Kelly says in Wausau, we have a weekly short study using Vince's book already. So in Wausau, get in touch with John Kelly and he'll hook you up with that. Um, I'm also willing to lead um, n- not eight to 12 weeks, uh, Bill Ray, but but three lessons uh, from the book. We can get the book out to you. And uh, again, you can go to uh, beresolute.org uh, for that. And, uh, and he'll create a, a code, a coupon code for 15% off. So I will let uh, Vince kind of conclude with that. So yes, Bill Ray, this book is conducive for that. At the survey on the way out after the webinar, excuse me, you can answer the question and we'll get back in touch with you. Uh, or you can reach me through email, brentjwelch at gmail, B-R-E-N-T-J-W-E-L-C-H at gmail. And we'll get you connected to a Zoom call that will be uh, maybe every other week. And we'll, we'll connect uh, together and we'll begin uh, launching into this study uh, by this book uh, that Vince wrote. Vince, are you back on live with us? 
I guess we have lost Vince completely. So with, uh, with that in mind, I am um, definitely moved uh, by this topic. Uh, again, uh, Vince Miller, the author of this book, 20 Lessons That Build a Man's Finances, uh, was joining us from Haiti and uh, we've lost connection with him and it's perfect timing because we're going to wrap up in just a few minutes. But really appreciate everybody joining us today. And I, I want to just restate bresolute.org. We can get in touch. Um, it was Joel who said, can I recap his points? So I sure will. I've been taking some notes here. Uh, the seven points uh, that Vince made is number one, God's our provider. And number two, and Jehovah Jireh, God is our provider. It's a great song on Spotify right now called Jireh, uh, You Are God. And that's one I'd suggest. Number two, trust in anxiety. So when you're anxious, turn to him with trust. He quoted Matthew 6 for that one. Uh, you know, look at the birds. God provides for them. He's certainly going to take care of you as well. Identity is another big one. That's the third one he listed. Uh, in his mission of hope for finances for men. And fourth is accept his lot in life with joy. Uh, accept the lot that he's given you in your life uh, with joy. And then he talked about stewardship from Luke chapter 12, being good stewards, which starts with the principle that God owns it all and we're stewards of his resources. Number six, giving. And number six, out of Deuteronomy 16, 17. And number seven, generosity and he mentioned it as the generosity principle from second corinthians 9 that kind of wraps things up for today thank you men for joining us uh, so much again uh answer the survey on the way out as you exit uh, we would appreciate it and if you're watching by youtube right now you can click the subscribe button below and connect with all of these leading with power uh, zoom calls that are now on youtube in behalf of Leading with Power, uh, thanks so much uh, for joining us. And um, how about a quick prayer? Father, we pray for all of those listening now that uh, you would help us to understand that you are the creator of the universe. You spoke and things came into being. As John wrote in John chapter one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Jesus, you're right there with us. And we, you spoke us, in a sense, into existence. And uh, you speak into our lives and bless us. And we can speak into the lives of others and bless them. And we can speak to you and we can bless you and we can honor you and we can praise you. Everything that we have is yours, Lord. We hold it with an open hand. And we, we sincerely ask that you would rearrange, rearrange it according to your purposes. And we do ask for blessing. We do ask uh, that you would help us to be generous and help us to share and help us to be wise. Give us wisdom, understanding, and knowledge as it comes to our finances. Uh, we thank you and pray this through Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us, men. On behalf of Leading with Power, God bless and be well. Goodbye for now.